In the Shadow of the Valley by Maggot Mosh Pit Chapter 6 Kethresh kept low in the bushes as the felines moved all around her, marching at a brisk pace. Keeping her sword gripped tightly, she watched a snow leopard pass, accompanied by a lynx. It looked like they were setting up an ambush for her. She frowned. No one knew she was here, so it must have been an ambush for Martin and his obnoxious friends. She turned to the path she was following to the capital, now blocked by felines moving across it. One glanced her way and she ducked into the bushes, wondering why she didn't wake up earlier. Seeing an escape route, she smiled, but stopped as she heard the sound of a crossbow being loaded. She looked around and saw a row of felines preparing to fire at the mountainside. She hesitated, then sighed and pulled out a knife, slinging her sword over her back. Looks like I'm gonna have to save their asses. She grabbed a passing feline by the neck and quickly put him in a sleeper hold. As he passed out, she moved towards the mountain. They'll be sitting ducks if I don't do something. Martin wiped sweat from his eyes. Phew. What they say is true. It's harder going down. Bronze looked at Arbalist once more, then towards the ground. Hey, I think that's the ground! The other two looked down and saw a small patch of brown and white, just visible through the thinning mist. Martin smiled and quickened his pace. You're right! Finally! His words echoed around the area. Kethresh saw the three at the same time the archers did. Shit. Too late. She quickly took out her sling and fitted a sharp rock into it. Whirling it until it whistled, she let fly at the middle archer. With a crack, the rock thudded into the back of the archer's skull, killing him instantly. The archer next to him looked over and did not fire, while the body fell onto the archer on the other side, causing him to fire prematurely. Hey! The other five let loose their shafts at Martin, Arbalist, and Bronze. Martin heard the thwip of bolts, but did not have time to react. One bolt shattered to his left, and another struck his leg. Ah! Ah! Guys! Climb faster! Biting his lip and ignoring the pain, he doubled his speed, slipping down as the cliff's angle became more shallow. Arbalist was spared from being hit, but Bronze was left clinging to the cliff face, cradling his head. At the bottom, Martin scrambled to a large rock and took cover behind it, wrenching the bolt from his leg. Luckily, it was only a flesh wound, but it hurt like hell. Another volley of bolts flew past, and Martin looked up at Bronze as Arbalist joined him. Bronze! Move your ass! Arbalist shook his head. He's in shock. I think he's hit. Bronze! Bronze had his eyes shut and was clutching his head. This is it. I'm dead. I'm hit in the head and will be joining my family in the afterlife. Another bolt smashed beside him, and he opened his eyes. I'm alive. But... Then he realized the bolt had pierced his ear and nothing else. For the love of... I'm coming, guys! The highest-ranking archer watched as another of his men fell to a slingstone. He yelled across the misty brush, Damn it, Zip! Get your man over there and flush out whoever sling it off! A stone silenced his tongue. Zip was crouching with Tezar a few meters away, and he saw the stone fly from a patch of trees. He turned around. Take five! Get that stone slinger! She nodded and dissolved into the leaves. Zip peeked from his cover again, seeing the archers huddled behind a log. They stopped firing, and now all three of their quarry were safely behind cover while some shade picked off Zip's men. He smiled, however. Martin peeked from cover as Arbalist bound his leg in a spot near his haunches. The archers aren't firing anymore. It looks like a couple are dead. Bronze took a look as well. What's going on? Arbalist tied off the bandage. There, rip my cloak for that. And does it matter? Guess it doesn't. Just hope whatever it is doesn't try and kill us next. Bronze ducked back. It's Kathresh! It has to be! Arbalist shook his head. I don't know, Bronze. She didn't like us very much. A stone fell from the cliff and bounced off Martin's head. He looked up, his eyes widening and his ears falling flat. Uh... What? What is... Arbalist whipped out his knife and threw, transfixing the feline that was about to drop down on top of them. Bronze drew his blade and pressed himself against the rock, watching the mass of felines descending upon them from the mountain. Arbalist vaulted over the rock and shouted, Run for it! 
The other two followed suit, rushing directly towards the archers, who had their eyes glued to the spot all the rocks were flying in from. Arbalist brushed past one. I'll take that! He snatched the crossbow from right out of her paws. What? Hey! The other two dashed past and into the bushes. The crossbowless feline yelled. Volley! Now! Joined by some archers who were first down the cliff, the felines fired a volley into the bushes. A gasp told them they had hit someone. Casting aside their crossbows, they dashed towards the spot the three had disappeared, steeled by their bolstered numbers. Martin bumped into Kathresh, who had a dagger under his throat in seconds. Whoa! It's me! Martin! She lowered the weapon. We must hurry. They've pinned down my location by now. But, Arbalist, and Bronze! There's no time! She grabbed his arm and tugged him along. They ran for a good long while before Martin tripped. Stop! My leg! She crouched over him and growled. Move it! Come on! She inspected his leg. It was bleeding profusely through the cloth bandage. Kathresh sighed. This is just a flesh wound, but it's bleeding pretty bad. She looked around at her surroundings. We can hide there. She pulled Martin to a small hole underneath a tree stump, ignoring the pained whine he made. Tumbling inside, they lay in the tight space, panting and keeping their eyes fixed on the mouth of the indentation. Bronze came crashing through the undergrowth, panting and clutching his head. Bronze! He looked over and jumped for the hole. Guys, am I glad to see you. Oof! Make some room! The fit was much tighter now, but none of them complained, lest a feline overhear. Bronze risked a whisper. Where are they? A feline moved past the hole, and Kathresh grabbed a hold of Bronze's muzzle to shut him up. She slid a finger across her neck, then let go of Bronze, standing slowly. She stalked up to the feline and grabbed the soldier's neck, applying precise pressure. The female soldier dropped like a sack of young root. Martin frowned. Was that necessary? Kathresh looked into the bushes. What? She isn't dead. Oh. Bronze grumbled. I like her better than Arbalest. Martin looked around, noticing their companion's absence. Damn. He must have blown on ahead. Come on, let's go. Quietly now. As the three snuck through the woods, Martin looked back at where their pursuers were. Um, how many did you... off? Hmm? Oh, uh, about three. Bronze grumbled again as Martin took another glance behind them. Um, did you have to? I mean... This is war, Martin, and those felines are the enemy. Everyone's seen what they're capable of, haven't you? Martin blinked as fire streaked across his vision, and he nodded. You're right, I suppose. Soon they came into a snow-blanketed clearing, Kathresh crouching to sniff the ground. Arbalist is nearby. You can tell by the smell? Martin asked, looking into the far woods of the clearing. No, by the tracks. Not sure why you want to find him, though. Martin opened his mouth to answer, but found he didn't have one ready. Um, well, we are going to the same place. I figured it would be easier. As they trekked along at a fast pace, Kathresh spoke softly, as not to draw any unwanted attention. I've seen his type before. Vendetta against any and all felines, regardless of circumstance. How can you tell? You only met him once. I saw it in his eyes, at Pill's house. When I mentioned killing the felines from his cart that attacked me, he seemed to light up. Martin looked at Bronze, who was lagging behind again. Well, that's pretty bad. I just got to this place and already I want to go home. Kithrash looked at him with narrowed eyes. You are not native to this place? No. I came here to find Pill and nothing else. He averted his eyes as he said. Nothing else. Kethresh hummed. Hmm. I would have taken you as native to these parts, despite your species. Bronze chuckled. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. You know, you should come with us. We are all going the same way. Definitely would have pegged you as canine raised. You have the same irrational idealism as canine soldiers. She looked ahead again, then to Martin. What's your story? You don't seem to fit in out here. You aren't a soldier. I'm a blacksmith. Oh? Um, I escaped from Frostblight. 
I heard the regent there was mild-mannered enough. Not anymore. He took my daughter and sentenced me to be executed. She's the only thing I have left now. I'm hoping Pill will help me with rescuing her. Kathresh pushed aside the bushes at the other end of the clearing, keeping silent for a while. Eventually, she spoke. Everyone's lost someone. Some more than others. I'll travel with you. Perhaps what you seek and what I seek are one and the same. I don't know what you mean by that, Kathresh. But I thank you. Ziff was not happy with the outcome of the battle. He yelled at the top of his lungs at Zip and Tezar. What the hell was that? You had one job. One! Maim a wolf and kill two others. And who gave the order to fire into the bushes where you knew there were soldiers? Who? The female archer stepped forward, ears flat, and tail between her legs. I did, sir. She wore the sash of a lesser commander, and Ziff wasted no time ripping it off. Get out of my sight, Freela. Go back to Frostblight for all I care. Just go! Y yes sir She picked up her bag and trudged back towards the valley, ashamed. Zick turned back to Tezar and Zip. How is he? He'll live, sir. Though what state he'll be in for combat is another story. Zip reported. Tezar growled. Shot cracked his left rib, and the head got lodged in. He'll never fight again. Zip stabbed the ground with his sword and cursed. Zick looked at the state their company was in, numbers thinning, morale dropping. Maybe we're going about this the wrong way. Maybe we should try a smaller group. No, we need a bigger group. Much, much bigger. Farl! The live tiger jogged up. Yes, sir? Do you have the troop deployments? Of course, sir. Here. Farl handed him a scroll. Zick ripped it open and read it quickly. There. Those stingy monks are holding out against our forces at a fort in the basin. They'll soon break the siege and we can ask for their help. Well, order them to help us. Zip nodded. Sounds like a decent plan. Farl, run a message to the commanding officer there. Tell them to wait for our arrival. Aye, sir. I'll get ready. The runner walked a short distance away and began stretching. Get the men ready. We'll be splitting up. Zip, Zick, you'll be coming with me. We'll track Martin while Tezar leads the men to join with. He opened the scroll again to get the name of the commanding officer. Oh, it's Stonewall. Tezar nodded and stalked off. Zick wasted no time picking up the trail, not wanting it to go cold in the snow. We'll be faster without that lot. Come on! Cole walked slowly into his tent, where Rita sat, looking forlorn. Her head shot up, and she stood. Cole held up his paw. I'm here to apologize. You already did. I, I mean, for shutting you up. It was just very angering, seeing you in the arms of a traitor. She sat, and so did Cole. He didn't seem like a traitor. He was very nice. Cole stopped himself from growling. He used you. He used all of us. Unlike Cole, Rita did not stop herself from growling. Don't say that! You never got to know him! We talked for a few hours. He was very intelligent. Cole shook his head. How can you still defend him? He confessed! You were there! You weren't there! You... Rita drew in a deep breath to calm herself. He did try to betray us, but he failed. Maybe he just made a mistake? I don't think so. I forbid you from speaking to him. If you did, he would surely try and manipulate you. I can't see him, B but I love him! <sighs> Ridiculous. You cannot love someone after having just met them. Rita growled in frustration and slammed her paw onto the table. I don't care what you think! Fresh tears began to form in her eyes as Cole looked unwaveringly into them. I'm having Garth executed for his treason. It will be best if you forgot about him. Rita's face became shocked. Then it screwed up in sorrow. She tried to respond, but she sobbed instead, burying her face in her paws. It broke Cole's heart to see his daughter like that, but he knew the person she had fallen for was not real. It was just a face Garth put on for the world. I'm sorry, I truly am, but you know the penalty for treason. She did not respond. Cole sighed and stood. <sighs> if... He trailed off and turned around to leave. 
Walking along the path, he clenched his fist and headed towards the tent where Garth was being held. Throwing aside the flap, he stomped up to the cage Garth was in. Open it. Although Garth was just thinking about how much he wanted that very thing to happen, now he wasn't so sure. He cowered in the back of the cage as the soldier guarding it stepped forward and turned the key. Cole beckoned. Get up or I'll kill you right here. Garth scrambled up and stepped out the door. Cole pushed him towards a table. Sit. He did. Cole leaned over the table, growling. You tried to trick us. You tried to lead us into an ambush at Folg. The men will want you dead, and so will Drifrasa. He grabbed Garth by the tuft of fur around his neck. And on top of that, you seduce my daughter. The soldier who was there could feel the tension in the room skyrocketing, so he quickly slipped out. I admit to trying to subvert you, and I did trick your daughter into sleeping with me. <sighs> you son of a bitch! In a flash of anger, the general dealt Garth a hard uppercut to his jaw, sending him flying backwards. Cole vaulted the table and straddled Garth, pinning him to the ground by his neck. Feline scum don't hold a candle to the likes of you! How could you betray us like this? You're a fox! Garth gasped. <sighs> the world is too screwed up to look out for anyone but me. Cole bared his teeth and growled. <sighs> I can't believe Rita fell for you! You disgust me and the world will be better off without you! He closed off Garth's airway completely, just as Harimau and the soldier walked in. Harimau tackled Cole quickly, pinning both arms to the floor. Cole, what the hell are you doing? Cole never doubted the actions of his men, and they knew this. We're going to chop his head off anyway! Why not do this now? Harimau released Cole and hauled him up. Do we have to? Not every spy is killed. He didn't even get far enough to do any damage. Cole poked Harimau in the chest. What he's done to my daughter cannot be reversed. Take pity on him. Let him live. Once we take the capital, he can serve a prison sentence. Cole looked at Garth's pitiful face, his yellow eyes full of fear. <sighs> I suppose he can wait to pass judgment. Garth sighed in relief, but Cole cut him off. But if I ever find that you've spoken to Rita after this, I'll have you drawn and quartered. Garth looked into Cole's face. Still terrified, he nodded slowly. Of course. Cole straightened up and walked out of the tent, Harimau in tow. Garth could hear Cole's parting remark. Come, we will plan the attack for two nights from now. The soldier who was left ushered Garth back into his cage and locked it. He sat down, pulling his only blanket closer to himself. If the canines attacked through the Arden forest, they would surely be slaughtered, and he along with them. He leaned back against the wall and wondered how he might worm his way out of this one. As the light fell and the soldier on duty began to snore, Garth wondered what Rita was doing at that moment. He legitimately liked Rita and might have courted her under different circumstances. His head shot up when he heard the tent flap open and saw Rita herself walk through. He smiled. He didn't like her enough not to manipulate her. The regent was grinning like a fool. His plan was actually working, and to think he believed Frey was smarter than that. Halen stood before him now, cowering. Joe spoke. Good work. Your daughter will be safe, do not fear. Uh, you instructed him to hand me the wine? Yes, sir. The regent leaned forward. Now, you understand that this must be done without incident. It will. Halen did not want to say very many words, as though his reluctance to speak might absolve him of some guilt. The regent laughed. <laughs> Good. I will await your holiday, then. Uh, what, what, um, what was it called again? It slips my mind. The Day of Flames.